Hi, welcome to our Fulbright application panel on Facebook Live. We'd like to thank you for, for joining us today. And again, we welcome you to our Fulbright application panel. We're joined today by five distinguished current Fulbright uh, students. My name is Emmanuel Pimentel. I'm a senior program officer for Ahmed East, and I work with the Fulbright program for the Middle East and North Africa. Now, before I introduce our, our panel, uh, I'd like to remind our guests that you can ask questions uh, at any time. Just post your questions on the comments section and we'll try to answer as many as questions as we can in the next hour. Now, uh, I'd like to introduce our five panelists who are currently in the Fulbright uh, student program. And as I introduce them, I'd like for them to uh, state or share with us their favorite thing about being a Fulbrighter. Now, our first uh, panelist is Raid. He's a second year student uh, from Tunisia, studying an MFA in animation at the Minneapolis School of Arts and Designs. Welcome, Raid. Welcome. Uh, thank you, um, Emmanuel and everyone who are joined us today. Um, so uh, one of my favorite things about being a Fulbrighter is the fact that I now have um, a bigger family or like a bigger network of uh, very creative and talented students around the US. So just by being a Fulbrighter, um, I found myself in touch with um, different other Fulbrighters in different states and uh, we're like collaborating on some stuff or like, yeah, if we ever need to talk about anything, um, yeah, I don't feel lonely uh, in the US. So that was amazing. Thank you. Our second guest is Inas, uh, who's a first year Fulbrighter from Egypt, studying an MS in economics at the University of Utah. Welcome Inas. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you so much for having me on this uh, live session. Um, my favorite thing about Fulbright is just, as you mentioned, right, that it's just you're, not, you're never alone. You're being a part of a big family wherever you go. Uh, when I first got my nomination that I'd be joining the University of Utah, I was excited, but I was also scared because I, I know nobody here. And all my friends or, or the people that I know or like far relatives are just nobody's here. So I just felt I was super anxious. I was lonely. But then on my first week, once actually I arrived, I was welcomed by the Fulbright community here. They like they met me at the airport. They helped me settle down. Like we are part of a big family. And even fun coincidence that when I traveled uh, during that like, last break, I was traveling to California just for fun. And then I was actually just going in one of the streets and just heard somebody saying something about Fulbright. And turned out I, I met a bunch of Fulbrighters. <laughs> They were from Egypt, they were from Palestine, and some were from Russia. So it's actually like you actually run into Fulbrighters everywhere. So it's just <laughs> being so nice being part of this family. Thank you. Our next guest is Saad. He's a first year Fulbrighter from Jordan. He's studying an MS in software management at the Carnegie Mellon University. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Amonel. Um, I'm Saad. I'm very happy to be with you today. Uh, my favorite thing about being a Fulbrighter, as Ryan and Inas mentioned, is being connected to a greater community and also having that reference here in the States, like being here for the first time and embarking on this journey of a master's degree. I always have the reference that I can go back to, whether that be the, the Fulbright Commission back home or the Emmet East uh, program here in the US. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Our next guest is Shnor. Uh, she's a first year Fulbrighter from Iraq, studying an MA in TEFL and TESOL at the Colorado State University. Yes, thank you for giving me the chance to share my experience. Uh, what I love mostly about Fulbright is the cultural exchange and also clarifying the misunderstanding that we might have. When I got her and I, I'm studying English, so I was so happy when my professor told me to know, never apologize for your pronunciation or your English. And the support we get from the professor, from the colleagues, like my American colleagues always tell us, ah, you are doing all this assignment in a second language and you are inspired by you. So this support and encouragement we get from Americans, it tells us that we shouldn't be worried to travel to a different country or come to study to US because you always get the support that you have. And always like accepting and respecting other cultures 
it's really so interesting to me. And we usually have like cultural events, like I always love to try what I see in the movies, like Thanksgiving or their American cultural events. And it's actually the time that we can talk about other countries. Like I can talk about my country, about Iraq, about Kurdistan, and they also can share about uh, American cultures. And we'll learn a lot about that. This is something I really want to, like something to take it back with me to home to see that we are respected and we can be uh, exchanging those cultural, even in college, the courage that I'm talking about, about uh, from professors and college, this is something that I want to take it back to my students to encourage them that you, you shouldn't be judged. You are always be supported by your colleagues, your teachers, and never apologize for small things like pronunciation or because Fulbright teaches us to think bigger, to have to uh, think about solving bigger problems. And this is a great chance because it really makes me change. And it, the whole process is a learning opportunity for me, starting from the application, the traveling, getting her, knowing people, everything is a learning chance for me that I really appreciate. Thank you, Shnor. Uh, our final guest is uh, Narjes. Uh, she's a second year uh, Fulbright from Bahrain. She's studying an MFA in film production at the University of New Orleans. Thank you, Amaral. Thank you for having me here. Um, being a Fulbrighter has been a great experience. Of course, our mirror, which everyone has said so far, but also on a personal level, it's an opportunity for me to grow as a person and feel more confident in my skills as a filmmaker in regarding to my major and also as a person you experience a new culture you're on your own in a journey but you're actually never on your own because you meet people who help you so you grow as a person you get to know your craft more and you meet great people and learn about a different culture which has been something very impressive since i came to the program and i really appreciate having that experience thank you and thank you again for the panel. And uh, we're going to move forward with, with the questions because we have quite a few questions. Um, first question is, why did you apply for the Fulbright program? Please, uh, please feel free to answer the question. I can go first. Oh, OK, I'll go then, sorry. Um, I applied to the Fulbright program because I wanted to be a filmmaker. And I believe that studying filmmaking in the US is something that I will learn a lot from since the US is known for producing a lot of films. And Fulbright just gave me that opportunity to uh, learn about the craft and be confident in my skills. So they give you the, the opportunity to apply to something that you might not be able to do otherwise, which I think is something anyone who has passion for something should go to. Okay, Schnorr? Yes, I applied for Fulbright because I wanted more than just a master's degree, because this is not only about education, those cultural exchanges we get. And I truly believe in the objective of Fulbright, and I wanted to be part of this great family. And let's not forget that this is a fully funded scholarship, so students don't have to worry about the financial and focus on their studying and growing themselves. Thank you. Right. Uh, yeah, in my case, it's uh, similar to Narjas. Um, well, as a digital animator, um, there are a lot of uh, modern software and uh, techniques and skills that uh, you need to acquire. And unfortunately, in my home country, um, that wasn't something I was able to find or get due to like the lack of logistics or like some of the items are expensive. So my previous university in Tunisia couldn't afford having them. So um, I realized that um, studying this, this field in the US uh, will uh, imp like help me uh, reach what I want to get and I, what I want to learn. So that's for, for that reason I, I applied for Fulbright. Does anyone else in the panel would like to answer that question? I would echo what the panel said. It's basically being connected with a greater community. It's not just about the, the, the degree that you will get here, uh, the experience you will gain and the network that you will expand your personal network through the Fulbright community itself. 
Thank you, Saeed. Now, uh, one question we had on the side is where can you find a link to uh, the link to apply to the Fulbright program? And you can find it on our link at Ahmed East. It's at ahmedeast.org forward slash Fulbright. And we'll post that um, on the notes or you'll be able to see that, that link um, uh, af after this session. Or please contact any of your Fulbright offices in your country and they'll provide you the link uh, to apply. Now, what tips do you have for the Fulbright application generally? I think my greatest tip is just to start as early as possible and to like invest some time, especially on the essays, because these require some time for you like to perfect them uh, in a way just to reflect who you are. Because for me, the essays, I, I'm not a good writer. So, so it was for me, it was a challenge a bit like to have like, I have to explain who, who am I and what, uh, what I want to, why I want to apply to the program and what are the characteristics of the program that I'm applying to and just like one page. So I guess, what helped me that I started as early as possible. I read, like I, I invested much time in writing the essays. I wrote like a couple of drafts. I had some of my friends review them just to get me feedback. So all these steps just require some time. So I guess if I hadn't started earlier, I would like I would have been stuck at somehow to be able to like to produce the essays in a quality that I was like, okay, I was just confident in applying with these essays. Thank you. Schnorr? Uh, yes, just one tip. Um, when you first start, especially for those who are first time applying for it, at the beginning, it may sound a lot of information and too many uh, scary stuff. But I just want to say this is you know, like uh, spend some time at the beginning, just go through it because there is enough time. Just go through it and see what is difficult to you. Some of them are just personal information and you can start with the easiest one then focus on the writing and the essays. So I just want to say, don't be like afraid of the application, just start reading through it. Give yourself some time to understand it, then start uh, filling it. Thank you. Anyone else would like to provide any tips? I would like to say, like, like of course, as Ina said, uh, start early is important, but maybe to some people, they can do it within a shorter time frame than others. But most importantly, I would say you would have to look within to understand exactly what your purpose and reason is for applying and know exactly what you want to do. That's the most important thing. As long as you're, you're very confident in what you want and how that and how you can benefit your yourself and your community when you come back from what from what you want to study and you can put that in writing and argue about it, then uh, that's the best thing you can do. Thank you. Um, we have a, a, a question on the side about eligibility criteria. And what are the elig eligibility criteria? It differs for, for each country. So we suggest that you contact um, your Fulbright office in your country to, uh, to discuss eligibility. Um, we, we encourage you to do that. Now, next question for our our panel, uh, what is your advice on letters of recommendation? Is there a criteria you suggest? And how did you pick your recommenders? Said? Yeah, uh, first of all, I, as I recall from the application, we were to select three recommended recommenders. Um, personally, I would recommend select, finding as much as you can recommenders. Uh, but select people who have worked with you very closely and that know you very well and try to select people from different parts of your work or your, your uh, uh, studies, like select people from different areas who know you in different ways. Uh, and most importantly, this is a tip that another food writer told me is contact them as early as possible. Like don't wait till the end to contact them. Make sure that you get in touch with the people that might recommend you as early as possible and uh, give them at least one month's notice in advance so that you can keep on following up with them. Uh, and yeah, and try to make sure that you can always, I know that the Fulbright recommendation has a template, but uh, in other instances, you could 
try to remind them of your work that you, the people that are recommending you remind them of your work, what you worked on, what you would like them to focus on and highlight. Yeah. Nice. Yes. And I just want to add to what Sad said, don't be afraid of reaching out to people because sometimes you might feel like, oh, will they give me a recommendation? Will they give me exactly the recommendation that might work? But you would be surprised how many people who know you would be willing to support you and give you these recommendations. In my case, I went back to my university and I approached my professors and they were more than happy to help me with that. And other places I looked for recommendations was at work. You, you can find people who would help you wherever you look, just don't feel hesitant to reach them and you will not be disappointed, I promise. Sure. Were there any challenges to finding recommenders for any of you? No, Jess? I'd say the challenge was like the timing as like as you mentioned, like some of my colleagues mentioned that you have to give people time. So I remember that I asked three recommenders and then some like some of them were not able to like they were just have so much busy schedules. They were not able to help me get the recommendation letter before the deadline. So what helped me that I already asked other like more than three people. So when some somebody wasn't able to provide me the recommendation letter, I had like another plan. So I was able to get like secure my three recommendation letters by the deadline. So as as like they mentioned, you have to start early on this because actually you're, you're like you're depending on some people to provide you with this. So you have to be mindful of their schedule and then also to be to have like another like plan if somebody wasn't able to help you get what you need by the deadline. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question uh, concerning age limits. Um, are there age limits to applying? There, there are no age limits. So don't be concerned about being too, too young. You definitely need to graduate out, you know, complete your, your undergraduate degree, but um, there are no age limits. Um, just check with your, your Fulbright program officer, I mean, office in your country. Um, uh, if you have any questions concerning that. Uh, next question, what is your advice on letter, letters of recommendation? Is, you know, is there a criteria you said, you know, you said, oh, excuse me, I, I just asked that question. Do you have any advice on research statements or personal essays? Right? And then Shnar. Uh, yeah, so, um... One of the things that you need to keep in mind uh, about like the essays, uh, they really take more time than what you will probably expect. So uh, start working on them in advance and uh, allocate a lot of time for that, like uh, maybe an hour or two a day, just like writing down ideas and thoughts uh, that you would like to include. And then the next day, reread that and uh, make some modifications and uh, uh, try to improve or add or like uh, um, remove some parts if you don't like. Um, it's always good to show that to friends and get their opinion. Um, and definitely make sure that you don't have uh, like uh, grammar mistakes or like uh, issues uh, with the writing. Um, and yeah, so that's why it will probably take you more time than uh, what you expect. So start working on it a bit early. Thank you. Nora? Yes, uh, I just want to say that um, it will make your application, your writing stronger if you have experience to add to it or examples. Uh, let's say you have a gap in your country and you want to study that subject. If you encounter that gap, for example, you can say when I was working at that field or when I was teaching, I saw that this gap, this gap with student or with employees, that's why I want to improve that. So don't hesitate to include example because it will make it more clear to, the, to those who are reading it. Why actually, how do you know that there is a gap? What experiences did you have? Plus, I also want to add that um, it's a good idea to know beforehand, why are you applying for master's degree? Just have a clear goal. I want to study master's degrees. I want to study it in the US, why United States, and also a uh, why Fulbright. So when you have those answers with yourself, it will make it much easier for you to just 
develop your paragraphs and explain it all in a more easier way. Yes, thank you. And us? Yeah, and just add to what Norris mentioned that, yeah, you have to be very specific about what you're saying, but you have to be very authentic about your experience. And then I remember I was a bit overwhelmed in the beginning that I didn't know how to start writing the essays, but what helped me is just, you have to stick to the prompt. Like in the application, there is a prompt that's very clear for each essay. So if you just focus on the prompt, like divided into some, like what are the keywords and this, and then you will start like developing ideas for it. And then you have to support your ideas with examples as Snor mentioned, and then being authentic and just being you, like you have to like uh, let people know your experiences, your goals, why, what, why are you aiming for, for this uh, opportunity and how will you benefit your community when you come back yeah. to your home country? Yes. yes. Sad. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. Uh, also, I would recommend, like for me, starting writing the uh, my research objective and my personal statement. It's to me, I when I was first starting, it was like a lot of work, and I was very careful and I put a lot of thought into it. But I think the correct way to go about it is not to be afraid about to just go about writing it. Just write your first draft. Think of it as a as a growing document that you will keep on improving. So. Once you start, just make an effort to put all your thoughts in there, write it however it comes out, and then iteratively work from there and keep on improving it. That makes it a lot more easier. Uh, instead of just focusing on making this one perfect document that you're just afraid to write anything that's, that does not fit perfectly into it. Yes. yes. Uh, any other suggestions at all? One thing that I'd like to encourage uh, these future applicants is uh, when you do write your personal statement or personal essays, uh, we encourage you to write how Fulbright will Im impact you. And then Nas had also mentioned this uh, and how you know, you'll use what you learned during your Fulbright experience, how will it impact your community? And so those are very important points to, to add to your personal statement. Um, we had a couple questions. I'm sorry. The um, one question is, uh, a student applied last year and was not, uh, was not accepted after the interview. Do you have any tips for a successful interview? Uh, would anyone like to answer that question? Um, I can answer this one because I also had the same, uh, situation. The first time I applied for Fulbright, I, um, was not accepted after, uh, the interview phase. Uh, because like um, I didn't know how to um, like answer questions and I was a little bit uh, afraid. So uh, I wasn't able to say everything I wanted to say. Um, so one advice, uh, take this rejection as a motivation to improve your, um, your ability to speak in front of people and also to improve your um, application if uh, you need to. Um, and then um, I, I recommend preparing questions, like try to remember the questions you got last year uh, during the interview and uh, prepare some uh, answers in advance, just like to um, prepare yourself to, uh, to know what to answer without um, like being confused or um, not finding words. Um, and uh, yeah, and after that, try to have a fake interview with your friends, like um, just to prepare yourself um, to like answer questions uh, in front of others. Thank you. Schnorr? Yes, just adding to that, sometimes it's about being worried and afraid before starting the interview. That's why you are confused and you don't know how to explain yourself. My tip is that uh, don't think about it as an interview, a question and answer. Just since you got at that step, it means that uh, you can answer those questions. You already know the answer, but it's just you are worried. So just think about it that you are a person who are talking to a group, a panelist that you want to say, I want this full breast scholarship because I can make use of it and I can come back and make a change in my country. You already know that you just have to communicate that in an easy way. I was so worried before the interview, but when I started and they looked so friendly and 
I just learned that they all want to know about me. That's the only way. I am here to introduce myself, to talk about myself, my goals, my wishes, that what I'm going to do during full rights and what I will bring back to my country. And I was so excited talking about that. So it makes it easier if you just think of it as a way to talking about yourself and your goals, and that's it. Thank you. Said, were you about to say anything? I could add just like as Noor mentioned that it's just about being yourself mainly just be you you made it this far because obviously that you went through the first round and what you wrote and you were able to present yourself well in paper and it's just about showing yourself visually now it's similar to how you showed yourself in, in writing it's just about presenting yourself visually uh interviews can be difficult they can be they can be you people get nervous about them but it's a, it's more about be, just what the full bar commission wants is to see you uh, and how you present yourself uh and it's just about being yourself when you go there and coming together and showcasing that person that you've already showcased thank you we do have a question um from from prospective applicants who are living outside their home country, if they can apply, um, you'll have to contact your uh, the Fulbright office in your home country for that eligibility requirement. But in most cases, we would like uh, for Fulbright applicants to be living in their home country, um, and uh, because it uh, the Fulbright is uh, it's not it's not just a scholarship program to to provide you an education. It's a it's a cultural exchange, and we'd like for our Fulbright nominees and, and grantees uh, to to have a cultural, you know, one of their first cultural exchange uh, experiences to, to be in the US um, for Fulbright. Um, next question, uh, excuse me, concerns GRE scores. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you study for the GRE and TOEFL before you were nominated? Uh, what was taking the GRE and TOEFL like? And do you have any tips or advice? Any? Oh, uh, Narjes. Uh, oh, well, the first thing I want to say about the GRE and TOEFL is you don't need to have those when you apply to the Fulbright. And that was a big advantage to me because when I looked at the requirements in my application, I was like, I don't have these, but I was able to still apply and then take these qualifying exams later on. So you, you have time to study for it after the application. I would say the GRE needs more concentration as it has more topics like math and English and other things that you need to uh, study for. The TOEFL can be on the easier side, but also remember that uh, not every major requires a GRE. So even if your GRE test was not as you hoped for, you can still get in, just do your best and study for both of them eventually things will work out depending on your major but it can be intimidating at first just uh, do your best while you practice for these exams read a lot especially for the GRE because it has a lot of terminologies that you might not have heard before so uh, enhance your vocabulary before you go to the GRE and make sure to time yourself as you take the test and practice so you know how to be prepared when you take it because it's very time structured so I guess get better in time management and practice, practice, and I wish you the best. I can add, yeah, please. Uh, I don't know, I think the application might be different from place to place, uh, but personally I do, uh, the GRE and the, the TOEFL scores were, were, you were required to apply to the Fulbright Commission in, in Jordan. Uh, I personally did the GMAT test and I did it before my uh, Fulbright application. I did it for the Fulbright application. And um, I honestly would recommend like to do it either way. It's very, uh, most of the programs will require GRE or GMAT, even though some programs are now uh, waiving uh, the need for it, but you'll always need a GRE and GMAT. Um, starting early and the time you invest in this uh, test 
uh, will actually benefit you because personally, I have improved a lot on my writing. I have improved a lot in my reading because of taking the GMAT test itself or, or similar goes to the GRE test itself. Uh, but yeah, they require a lot of practice and by practice, whether that's actually practicing questions, there are a lot of online resources you can use to do that. And uh, I think you have to prepare well for that, for that test. Uh, it, will, it will definitely uh, impact uh, your, your application, uh, positively impact your application, and it will definitely positively impact you when you start, when you get hopefully admitted uh, in the Fulbright program and in, in a university. And, and one thing to note, uh, just as said, said it, it, it differs the requirements per country as far as having a GRE or, or GMAT test prior to your application or a TOEFL exam. Uh, that requ those requirements differ for uh, country to country. So I would check your country, uh, the Fulbright office in your country. Um, but one thing to note also that, especially with the TOEFL, um, that most universities will require at, the, at least an 80. So um, as a minimum requirement for acceptance. So if you're doing practice exams or if you've taken a TOEFL IBT exam and scored below, it, below an 80, I would not discourage you from applying. I would encourage you to apply um, because there, um, there, there is also uh, eligibility if you're selected as a nominee after your applica application to, to participate in uh, long-term English. And that's something that's will be discussed later on in, po in possible uh, Facebook Live um, um, sessions. But uh, I would not, you know, I would discourage you um, from applying if in the previous exams, I, you know, especially TOEFL exams, you'd scored less than an 80. I, I still would, would strongly encourage you to apply. Um, with the GRE, I, yeah, I would, I would speak, and GMAT, I would contact your, uh, the Fulbright office in your country to see if it's if, if it is a requirement prior to the application. Next question: How early did you start your application? Did you? I can go. <laughs> Go ahead. Please. I think uh, it depends personally on how much time you usually take, but I started really early on. I think it was at least four months in advance because I knew that I wanted to apply and I was preparing to apply. So I started early on. I know other people who started like um, two months in advance, uh, six weeks in advance, but it depends on, first of all, where you are in your preparation in general are you ready to write your personal statement are you ready to take a gmat or gre exam um and yeah if if so how much time will it take you but the more you prepare the better chance you will have of course all right i can go next yeah uh, so in my case, the first year when I applied for Fulbright, I didn't start um, preparing for it uh, way too early. I guess it was about like a month before the deadline. Um, and uh, that wasn't enough, honestly, because I found myself rushing uh, during the, uh, the last two weeks uh, to uh, prepare everything. Um, and uh, yeah, and in the end, I didn't get accepted. Uh, but the next year, um, I already had like a base to start with, uh, based on my experience uh, the first year. So I started uh, early and I also uh, worked on improving my application and giving uh, all the sections more time. Um, same thing for uh, the recommendation letter. I uh, contacted my uh, uh, professors uh, like early just to make sure that they will send the recommendation before the deadline. Um, and uh, yeah, I, so um, it's always good to start working early on the application because uh, as I mentioned before, it will take more time than what you will expect. Any other answers or advice? 
Yeah, I remember that um, application in Egypt like started in February, so I started like mid February and then I, as Snor mentioned before, I just went through the application, knew all the requirements. I just started to fill the basic like personal information and then I started to work because I remember that the application in Egypt required like language proficiency uh, tests. So when I was applying, it was like in 2020 when the pandemic hit. So I was lucky to have had the chance to even because I started early, I had the chance to have an exam. But like if I just like waited for more than two weeks later, all the testing centers were like, shut down and everything. So actually like starting early benefited me and then yeah, and it took more than much more time than I imagined. I remember like okay, although I started like working on the essays maybe like in March, I spent like more than two months working on them. So that's why you have to be mindful of your time. Thank you. Um I had a question uh on the side. Do, do you recommend applying for the Fulbright program before taking or pursuing an MA degree or after? And so um what I we recommend is that you uh, you can apply for the for the full bike program right after you graduate um, from your undergrad degree. It, it is it's a master's um, uh, scholarship program, um, and but we do recommend. I well I you know yeah you know, we recommend that you you do complete your your undergrad degree before in a timely manner before the start of the summer, you know, the summer months before the, the master's program begins in the U.S. So it's it's very important that most universities will accept you conditionally as long as you complete your your bachelor's degree prior to arriving. And most in most cases, the summer, early summer before you arrive in the fall. Now, do you need a, a master's degree to apply? You don't. But for those in some countries who completed a three-year licence degree. There are a large number of universities in the United States that will not accept a three-year licence degree. And, and students who, who after their licence degree, uh, completed a master's degree and added two years to their, to their educational academic history, um, that was sufficient to for those, for many of these universities, for them to apply for for their master's programs. So just be aware, it's not impossible to um, to to gain admission to a university without uh, a master's degree, but it could be challenging if you only have a, a three year licence. Uh, and and with a three year licence, there there's 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 enough universities, but it yeah, that that accept the licence, but it might not be the university that you're looking for or or trying to pursue. And that's where we, you know, we, you may be encouraged to, to, to apply for a one-year master's or, uh, or a two-year master's in your home country before applying to, uh, to a graduate program in the U.S. Um, under the Fulbright, uh, because it will enhance your, your, your CV, but also provide you more opportunities to apply to, to other, you know, more, more universities in the U.S. But, um, you do not need a master's degree to apply to uh, uh, to the Fulbright scholarship. I hope you answered that uh, well. <laughs> uh, next question: What are some of the benefits of being a Fulbrighter? Uh, Schnorr. Yes. First, being part of this program, it's really great chance. And it's so competitive, so it's not easy to be or um, be part of the Fulbright family. And also the advanced academic knowledge that we get. Uh, it's not easy for everyone or in every country to just come and study in the United States for master's degree. But Fulbright makes it so easier for you, a fully funded scholarship in your country that you can apply for. And I actually, I learn a lot in the university, the subject you are studying, the uh, academic connection we are building with the professors and people there. And also beside the advanced academic knowledge, also the cultural experience, because you don't know what are you capable of until you are trying something. For example, let's say personal improvement, traveling. I have always traveled with other friends or family, but for Fulbright, I had to travel from the corner of Middle East to the corner of the United States 
just being alone. I'm learning from that. I'm being stronger, being more independent. That will help me when I go back home to be a different person. So there are a lot of benefits, but most I will say like the academic knowledge and also the cultural experience that we get, it will actually change you. Yes. Thank you. Any other answers? Um, I can I can go next to talk about my experience. One of the uh, benefits and like advantage of being a Fulbrighter is whenever you have a conversation with anyone, especially like from the professional field or like your professors or anything, just the fact that you mentioned that you're a Fulbrighter uh, gives you like a special spot for them. So they, uh, because they know it's a highly competitive um, scholarship. So if you got this scholarship, it must be that you're really good. So um, they listen to you. They uh, try like to um, uh, free some of their time just to have a conversation with you. And definitely they want to know a lot about your culture and your background. So uh, it's like working uh, on both ways because by uh, telling people that you're a Fulbrighter, uh, they become uh, curious and uh, interested in knowing more about you, uh, about what you've done uh, and like your portfolio if uh, you're an artist and uh, definitely uh, like uh, what are the, um, what background you have and uh, your culture definitely, so. Thank you. Um, I have another question that's slightly similar. What is, what has been your favorite part about studying in the United States? If you haven't answered that question. Nigel? Well, there are a lot of favorite parts for me from studying in the United States, but I must say that it's a very friendly environment if you come and you feel overwhelmed. Studying in the United States has been a very flexible experience to me because uh, as everyone mentioned before, you create a family here. So you have a, a big support group. Your professors, your colleagues are all understanding and they also are aware that you came from a different place. So they help you adapt to a different environment. You learn from them, they learn from you, you get to share your culture with them and they are very interested to know and learn about different cultures, very friendly people. Um, the environment can be very exciting to work because you're trying something new with, with the new people who are kind and passionate just as you are. So it's a, just, it's a positive environment to study at and I really appreciate being given the opportunity to share my culture and learn at the same time. Say. Yeah, I'd also add, of course, a big part of it is, as Nurj just said, it's an opportunity to share your culture uh, with people in the States. Uh, also, a big thing, a part of it is um, you're actually at the heart of a lot of where the, of where the research is happening. And you're exposed to, um, to, the, uh, to, to the latest research. What you, if you have something that you're working on and... Um, uh, you want to get connected with someone, with anyone in that field who is on the forefront of that field, uh, you can through your faculty, through, through your university network or, uh, or and so on. So there are no limits to what you can do in a research and academic field here being in, it, being in the States. Thank you. Now, some other questions. Uh, what... <sighs> Was it scary to leave home and move to the United States for two years or one year, depending? How have you dealt with homesickness? Right? Uh, yeah, it was honestly a little bit scary for me because I traveled during the pandemic, like uh, in summer uh, 2020. So uh, just the entire situation of like, uh, there's a like global pandemic and everyone is afraid and 
um, you're not sure, especially like airports, that's where most of the cases happen. Uh, and uh, you're traveling to a new country and uh, you're gonna leave by yourself. Uh, so yeah, the entire situation was uh, honestly scary, but uh, thankfully, like once I arrived here, um, everyone was really welcoming and uh, my university provided a lot of uh, safety measures. So uh, it was not hard for me to adapt and to like um, a week after I found, I, I felt that I'm already a part of uh, this community and uh, this uh, like uh, city. So um, it was hard to leave the country, but it was also easy to adapt. Um, and uh, honestly, sometimes I miss home. I feel that homesickness, but um, thankfully I keep calling and talking to both my families and my, uh, my family and my friends from Tunisia um, on like daily or sometimes weekly basis so that I, I feel that they're here with me. So I don't um, like feel that homesickness that will affect my experience in the US. Uh, Shnur and then Inas. Yes, yeah. Thinking about it at first, it's like scary and family is not helping because it's so sad to say goodbye friends and family all around you before you travel and you think about that. But when I got there, it's uh, I didn't expect that. Like always, the professors and the students always come to you and ask you, how are you doing? Do you miss home? What do you need? And there are like uh, the international program and everyone is supportive. So you know you always have someone to go to. And I will always recommend that the more people you know, it's better like when you make friendship with others, when you sometimes go out at the weekend, try to learn something, focus on entertainment sometimes. And also we have the chance to communicate with family. Although at the beginning, because of the time difference, it was so challenging. I didn't know when to call. Uh, it was confusing, but it all will change to a great experience that we, you will think about it later on. But yeah, the more people you know, uh, the more easier it becomes. And if you find other full writers in the same university, that will be perfect. <laughs> Inas? Yeah. Uh what you all have mentioned yeah it's just great in the beginning, especially when you keep thinking about it like i'm creating a new life in somewhere i have never been there i don't know anyone there but like just it, things happen smoothly more than like smoother than you, you can imagine like you will definitely meet people like it, it's highly likely that you will find other full writers in the university that you will be going to they will definitely help you uh, there will also be the international student office at the university. They are very helpful. They are very resourceful. They they actually help me find my housing and they prepare everything in advance before I even land here. And uh, as the store mentioned, you just make sure you have people. Like you, when you feel like the peak of homesickness, just yeah, you definitely can call your family, your friends, but you have to be also to indulge yourself in more like activities. Don't let yourself be alone uh, or just like you feel that you are, I'm just so lonely because you will find other people here like international students or other full data students. They will have the same experience as you. They will have the same feelings. You can always be together, share, share your fears and then you'll find, yeah, I just can get over it and then things will be much better than you expect. Thank you. Um, I have a question on the side. Uh, Sayed, were you about to say anything? Uh, had a question concerning dis uh, disabilities. Can I apply with a disability? Yes, you can, and we we highly encourage you to apply. Uh, and if you're selected, we will find reasonable accommodations. Um, I would uh, contact again your your Fulbright office in your country uh, for more questions con um, concerning uh, applying uh, and, and applying if you have a disability but we do encourage you. Um, as we um, have a question concerning uh, GPA, if, if my GPA is weaker, can I, can I still, can I apply? Yes, you can. I mean, it, 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 there are limitations with universities. I mean, there, there shouldn't, uh, there aren't, um, minimum requirements for GPAs um, with, with the Fulbright, but I would check again with the Fulbright office 
if each country you know, uh, each country may have a specific GPA requ you know, requirement. Um, because if you do have a low GPA, it, it, yeah, we would want you to strengthen your GPA uh, because it, the, the U.S. education system is can be demanding, and our our, our panelists can 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 state this, and uh, we want to make sure that we're sending you to the U.S. Uh, to succeed and, and that you have the tools prior and skills prior to arriving in the U.S. to succeed. So, yes, yeah, yeah, there aren't any, you know, minimum requirements for a GPA, but we, you know, we encourage you to apply, but at the same time, we want to make sure that you succeed academically in the U.S. Um, we have a couple more questions. Okay, so we have a, a student that, uh, oh, we have an applicant that has a question. Um, we'll finish the degree in three years instead of four, and approximately we'll uh, finish the requirements by the end of August. Um, and, and that's when they'll get their certificate. Should um, should they apply uh, this year or should you wait till next year? So if you're graduating in August, that is uh, completing your degree, that's too late. We really encourage students who are still working on their degree to, to graduate in, in May at the latest. And, and even though the, the, the degree program begins, uh, most degree programs in the US begin in late August, you still, we still have to, Provide time to to apply for, you know, uh, apply for your visa, and that could take that could take weeks or that could take months. And so, in, in the safe side, we want to make sure that you have come. You will complete your degree by May, and and also the universities that um, uh, that, that students you know our, our nominees apply to um, will want to verify that they the, you know that their applicants are completing the, their degree by May because they can't, you know, they can't hold your spot uh, for the whole summer. Most universities uh, will have a, a deadline to, to complete their, uh, for nominees to complete their, their bachelors. And they also have a limit on how many they can accept and, and, and hold. And, and so, um, and, and most, most universities will, will you know, will wait at the end of May, early June to hold um, your, your space and, you know, and so that you can finish your degree program and uh, in, in your home country. Um, but if you're going to, if you're planning to complete your degree in, in July and August, it's too late and we encourage you to apply um, uh, to apply uh, next year. And do I have one more question? Manuel, can I can I just add one note? Sorry, I, yes, regarding please. your previous note on the GPA. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're more aware of the application process itself and the acceptance criteria. But I just personally, I wouldn't like people to feel discouraged, even if their GPA is a bit low, because it is one factor in multiple factors of the applications. And if you can make up for that GPA number factor through your GRE scores, GMAT, as well as your personal statement, your research objective, you will always have a shot in, in my belief. And please correct me on that if I'm mistaken. No, that, I mean, you're right. I, I, it, the GPA and your transcripts are one aspect of your dossier, academic dossier that we send. They do look at uh, your CV, your work experience, um, other experiences that you have. Now, you also uh, have to, uh, if you do have a slightly low GPA, um, adjust your expectations as far as where you want to apply. Because it, for those really highly competitive universities, you're competing with, with, with nominees and applicants with much higher um, um, GPAs and that's and for some of those universities that's what they're looking at GPAs and um, along with, with with the other aspects of uh, work experience and other experiences so we for those with lower GPAs we ask you to uh, adjust your expectations um, 
but also you know as far as selecting universities and that's what your program officer at Ahmed East or 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 IIE is there for uh, to help you uh, select the the correct university that fits uh, your criteria and your dossier. Um, you, we we encourage you to to uh, to have a flexible expectation as far as uh, you, you, the universities that you will apply to in the end. But that was a good point, Said. It's it, it's not just your your grades. It, it's also again your work experience, other awards and experiences that you have, your recommenders. Um, that that will um, decide whether or not you're accepted at a university. Yeah. I think we have time for one one more question. Um, have you been able to make American friends? And uh, I think you've mentioned that. Um, but uh, I know for for Raid, he arrived in August, 2020, in the height of the pandemic when, when uh, everything was virtual. Um, I'd like for him to, to share if he was able to make friends, but also for the rest of you as well. Yeah, I can definitely start uh, talking about that because uh, at first it was really hard uh, because um, everyone was like uh, staying home and even outside, like there was social distancing. so. Um, it was not easy to start conversation with strangers, uh, even though like in the US, that's one of the things that uh, uh, like it's easy to have, like start conversation with strangers and like making friends with that, uh, like making friendships. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, like when I first arrived, that was uh, difficult. I wasn't able to do that. But thankfully, um, uh, being a part of the uh, community uh, at my university and like attending classes with uh, multiple students and um, having conversations with them uh, virtually um, helped me to uh, like start making connections and like through them I was able to have more friends and and then like uh, soon um, everything became like uh, uh, so connected that uh, I was able to have uh, more friends and uh, I was invited to like uh, uh, their holiday uh, parties or like uh, uh, some events or uh, stuff like that. So yeah, that, that was definitely uh, a good experience. Anyone, anyone else like to share? Oh, yes. Yeah, I also would like to add that Universities tend to tend to have resources for international students. So if you come here and you don't know anybody, they will take care of you until you're comfortable. I remember I also came in the summer of 2020, so it was an overwhelming experience, but the Office of International Student really helped me uh, get connected to other Fulbrighters and they helped me settle in. Other than that, your classmates are also going through these things when you first come to the program it's your first day but it's also their first day so it's easy to make connections with your colleagues and uh, get to know each other as i'm sure everyone during these times have concerns and worries but i guess that's also one thing you can connect through uh, but eventually you will make and the more you go further in your program, you will learn more and get to know more people. So you don't have to worry about being alone. Eventually you will connect with. Thank you. Yeah, I have one thing to add as well. Um, clubs are uh, a good resource for uh, making connections on campus. Um, so you can either uh, join clubs or make your own club. And that's what I did last year when I uh, like at some point, I didn't find a club that fits me perfectly or like fits my needs. So I launched my own club and uh, that gives you um, uh, the opportunity to be like a leader in your community and uh, at the same time, make connections with others. So, yeah. I would also like to add that uh, it's very nice to like you're making friends here in the states and also through your university as Nar just mentioned like you have the international uh, community you make friends internationally and through your Fulbright network you, you make friends from all around the world not just from the states and that's a, that's a, the beauty of it 
Now, before we close, uh, is there anything else that you'd like to add before we, we end our, converse, our panel? Um, I can just say to anyone who's uh, watching this live right now and still didn't start uh, applying for Fulbright, even though they they know like uh, that um, they're perfectly eligible for it, I would say start working on it today. Don't delay that. Um, just start doing it, and you will not regret. You'll thank me two years from now. <laughs> <laughs> Great, that's good advice. Well, well, uh, Nigel. Say. Uh, yeah, I just want to add to what Rod said. This will be a life changing experience. You will get to introduce your culture. You will learn from a different culture and you will also learn. So it's going to be two to three years and you will benefit a lot for a lifetime. This is something that will change you for, for your rest of your life. So please, if you ever see this, um, if you're interested in applying to the Fulbright, do it. It's a positive experience that will change you for the best. And last one, Schnorr. I just wanted to say that don't miss that chance. We may not have enough time here to talk about all the advantages that Fulbright have, but this is a great opportunity that you should not miss and you should apply for it. Thank you. Well, I think uh, we just uh, were a little bit past the hour, so I, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us uh, on this panel. I specifically want to thank our panel of Saeed, Raid, Schnorr, Narges, and Inas. We wish you success this, this semester. And if you're interested in applying for the Fulbright Foreign Student Program, visit our website at amadis.org forward slash Fulbright. Uh, the website will, will provide you information on eligibility requirements for each country some helpful tips on the applications and there are links to, um, to, to different, you know, those different tips. Uh, the deadline differs for each country. So the first application for one of the countries is May 1st. So get started, uh, we encourage you to. Uh, we will be hosting another Facebook Live in the week of April 11th. And it, the focus will be under, understanding essay writing and, and understanding plagiarism, which is really important. So please join us and uh, thank you again um, for joining us and, and have a great evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>